Gentlemen, welcome to the work session of the Poland Board of Education this evening, Monday, October 19, 2020. At this time, I call the meeting to order and we'll rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. Well, thank you very, very much. Mrs. Muntean, will you please call the roll, please? Ms. Colucci? Here. Dr. Janopoulos? Here. Mr. Polis? Here. Mr. Riddle? Here. Mr. Warren? Here. Uh, Mr. Zura, do we have an audience uh, zooming into us tonight on live stream? We do, President Riddle. We have four folks joining us right now. Okay. We move to agenda item number four tonight. It's a discussion from Mr. Janafe about our academic achievements. We're going to discuss the National Merit Scholarship and our map data from each building. Mr. Janafe. Thank you. Um, you pull this up there, uh, Mr. Zero. You can see. We've got two commended students. Is yours coming up? Yeah. He's not coming up. Mine's spinning there, Mark. Yeah. So you can see, are you guys able to pull yours up? Yep. Board members? Yep. You must be just special. <laughs> you want to take a look at that? So we have two students. And one of these students was uh, the athlete of the week, I believe, two weeks ago, Will Davies, as he was a football player, and Anthony Gallo uh, were commended students of national merit. Again, I believe last year we had two go all the way to, to be finalists. So uh, we're, we've got tremendous representation in the area of national merit, scholar, commended students. Uh, the next one, are you going to need this back, Mark? Yeah. Uh, so the next one, thanks. If you pull up, you'll have our, uh, our map PDF. So you can see, I'm going to let Mr. Zura go through this. He put this together with Mr. With Nadim today, wasn't? Did he take off? Yeah. Nadim, Nadim, thank you for your help putting this together for us today. Um, but one of the things I wanted to emphasize, as we continue to talk from last spring to this fall, and we've praised our staff and our students and families, parents who took over the role as teacher um, last spring and, and still even to this fall, we have over 300 of them currently um, taking on that role. But this map that is, is something that we started to use last year. And unfortunately we couldn't use it in the spring because of the shutdown. So this fall, we were all anxious to see how well we did relative to a quote unquote non COVID year. So we have two charts here, one for language arts and one for math. I'm going to have Mr. Zura go through both of those with you and certainly answer any questions that you may have. But once again, I think you'll see pretty clearly that our staff and students, our administrators have done a tremendous job. Um, last spring and, and well into this fall. So, Mr. Zura. All right, thank you, Mr. Janafe. And just want to reiterate, you know, one of the things going back to the spring, the challenge that Mr. Janafe had to our administrative team is even though we have to suspend our normal in-person day-to-day activities, he was adamant about the charge was to keep the caliber of Poland excellence going strong. And I will tell you that this data 
truly doesn't lie. It's remarkable. Because what we can look at is this written score in the blue is the national average. Now, when we take these tests, this is mean that's measured against 2017 data, which would show year-over-year -year growth with no pandemic. And I reference grades one through eight. Now, kindergartners, as you're aware, with COVID, they couldn't have kindergarten screening this year. So Mr. Masucci has actually uh, implemented this in his building. We don't have the data back from kindergarten yet. But I want to take a minute and look at grades one, two, and three. And what's remarkable about the ELA and also math, you'll see that in terms of first grade, when we tested our kids in the fall, 84% of our first graders scored above the national average. So average, high average, and high are the three highest categories. Uh, in math, which I'll show in a minute, Mr. Janipe was referencing, we have 81%. So that's kid, last year's kindergartners going through COVID and then benchmark testing again in the fall. You'll notice our second grade numbers as well. Um, just, just remarkable. In ELA, 80% of our students are average, high, average, or high. 83% are average, high, average, or high. And that goes into third grade too, which we have a third grade reading guarantee. And the McKinley Elementary teachers are busy with so many tests that they have. They have the ELA, um, um, excuse me, the ELA, ELA test that they're doing right now. They have to have blanket gifted testing, and then they have to do the math testing. So the third grade students are truly being tested because it's still, you know, all systems go from Columbus. So one of the things that Mr. Janifey referenced was the math. And you can see this data was put together with the help of Nadine today with analyzing the software. I want to also show the math cohort, which, as you've heard Mr. Janifey mentioned, that our district under his leadership implemented the Bridges program several years back. And that is continuing to pay dividends because we're seeing our math scores continue to improve. So right now, um, the math is all systems go. And we also implemented the um, really great reading program along with the HD Word program, Study Sync, um, that my own kids are personally doing. It's been a really, really neat program. And now we have a district-wide literacy framework and research-based programming available to all students, tier one, tier two, and tier three with your special education students. So again, this is just remarkable and it's going to continue to pay dividends. So I'm very, very proud of our staff, our teachers, again, just getting it done in the spring. Uh, when, when other folks are going through the motions and just scanning things and throwing it up online and saying just scan those and do it, our teachers truly made that personal connection. If you recall, one of the things we were talking about in previous sessions was about the use of the Zoom conferencing. Our stats showed that we were second behind the ESC in usage. And actually right now, they're out of cloud-based storage because our teachers <laughs> use so much of that storage to post videos and make those personal connections with kids. So Jonathan and Nadim and um, the team has been working through that. What a great problem to have. So that's just kudos to what we're doing here educationally. And I, I just really want to thank our teachers, thank our parents too, for sitting side by side with the kids at home, getting that done. And these results are going to continue to pay dividends. So we're not seeing a big slide that you would anticipate going away from the day-to-day -day instruction when we had to go online. And then obviously we were a little bit delayed starting out the new school year, but you see our kids are right on track and doing very, very well. So kudos to all of you. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Zura. Any questions on those two? Thank you, Mr. Riddle. Then we can move to... Uh and I'd like to accolade what Mr. Zura had to say. And I know that we have a small audience tonight, but I also know that we are being recorded and that our community will be able to go online and observe our board meeting. Sometimes we have to take a little pause and appreciate what we have. And I'd just like to you know, thank everybody who's participated in the success of these numbers. It goes to our, our uh, administration, and our teachers, the parents, the students, I, I feel a great sense of pride and I want to thank everybody involved. And that goes for the next item on our agenda, also the COVID reporting. What a great privilege it is to be meeting together tonight and that our kids were in school today. Mr. Janife, item number five, our COVID reporting. Yes, I just want to report that uh, um, 
as of last week, we had our deadline for the uh, start of the second second nine weeks will be on Monday, and we have uh, 100. We had 329 total on uh, remote first nine weeks, and we have 111 of those children returning to um, live and in person starting next week. Um, I was uh, happy to say I think we had one child request going from, for certain reasons, uh, request going from live to remote. Mm -hmm. So we've had 100, 111 requests to return starting next week, which we will accommodate that. I know transportation's already actively engaged in making sure that those students that are requesting transportation that they're added to the uh, bus routes and I know Miss Romer who you'll hear from in a little bit is very excited about having students back in and the ability for 111 students to participate in the lunch program so as of today we have approximately 86 percent total in live and in person for the second nine weeks Thank you, Mr. Janifei. You're welcome. And once again, you know, it's accolades to our janitorial staff, the cooperation we had over the summer with moving our furniture out and into storage. Uh, I just feel we have so much to be uh, grateful for. And when the numbers of COVID infections are minimal, I'm very, very grateful. I uh, move to item number six, our food service director, Mrs. Romer is here to give us a report about the National Nut Nutrition Group and uh, to update us as to how our food service is going. Hi, Mrs. Romer. to our title funding. So it's important 
that regardless, even though it's a very um, unique school year, we want to still promote, obviously, to get the, the most title funding. And we're doing better than last school year. Typically, we have about 15.5% pre reduced. Right now, we're about 16.1%. So we're really pushing for that, and anybody who would fill it out, even if you don't think you qualify, it is always worth filling out the application just to have um, just to have some assistance. So to touch on the school nutrition program, right now we hand out meals every Monday. Today, Officer Kent and I were passing them out as the families drove by. We average about 65 to 75 students that participate weekly, and we send home seven breakfasts and seven lunches, so that covers the weekend meals. And also anybody that's doing in-person learning, we have a few families that will pick up just the weekend meals for those kids as well. So anybody in person can still get those two weekend meals on top of anything they're getting in person at the district. Um, so we're working on increasing those numbers actively and we're getting a lot more um, families participating that have non-school age children. So it, the program is not just for the children in school, it's anybody 18 and under. So we have gotten an increase in the community participation, which I think is great. Um, our breakfast numbers in person, we're almost to the point of doubling our participation that we have budgeted. So it's a great number to report that we are close to double that. And as far as lunch, we have hit budget multiple days and we're, we're looking at, I would love to double participation for lunch too. So it's continually a work in progress one day at a time. And I'm proud to say that my staff, as well as administrators, everybody here, I mean, everybody is a support system for getting these meals to the kids. So. I just, I commend everybody and it's part of it. I'm proud to say that we can serve the kids hot meals as well. A lot of districts are just doing four sandwiches and you know, sometimes it's, it's the ability of the district and what you have to work with, but we're able to provide the kids hot meals every day. So to tie it all together, I'm, we're trying to think of other ways to encourage people to take, take part in this program because again, it's, it's free. So one of the ways we're going to start is at the high school, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, as the students are leaving the building, Mr. Snyder was, was kind enough to help with this, um, we're going to send the kids out of the building with a treat, essentially. So what this is, is we have a mealtime waiver in place from the SEMO Summer Program, which allows us to serve components at odd times of the day, maybe breakfast is normally in the morning. We can send them home with a snack that technically qualifies as a reimbursable breakfast. So every single student that's leaving the building at the high school will receive this on their way out the door. We have a tally system in place and we will get reimbursement for breakfast for every single child that takes that. Hmm. So that's a huge step in the right direction of, as far as increasing our numbers. The other option, um, or the other thing we're utilizing is anytime we have a special function is what we call it, um, as far as PTO asking for Halloween treats for the kids, maybe at Union or Middle McKinley, we're able to turn those into reimbursable breakfast as well. So if you provide a juice and a two grain item, that's a half full grain item, those can technically be a reimbursable breakfast. So at the end of the month, um, on the 30th, for Union and Middle McKinley, every child that is given a treat is counted as a reimbursable breakfast. So that alone, <laughs> that day will greatly help us. So we're trying to look at ways to do more fun days across the district, but that's where we're at right now. And we're, I, I would encourage anybody to take part in the program. It's a great opportunity that we've been blessed with as far as the state. Um, they passed a bill through Senate that continues this <coughs> program, the seamless summer free program um, through the end of the school year, the whole through June. So it's a great opportunity. Um, please pass the word along to your family, friends, community members, anybody, um, the information on the school website. We've gotten an all call that we sent out to the, the parents in the past. So it's, it's a great program to be part of, and I'm, I'm thankful to be part of the district helping families. And you also have in front of you a food service report. It recaps the entire month of September. So we always do one, you'll have it the month after. But just a quick brief overview, so at your, at your time, take a look over it, and that's everything I have. I would, before, she, Megan, sits down. I think I want to emphasize just one thing because she said we're able to get those meals to the children. I don't know, and I want to emphasize for all of our folks, all of our residents, that our kitchen staff, they are delivering all the meals to classrooms. 
significantly different than when we all traditionally went to school or we know about going and having lunch. We all go to the cafeteria and we go through the lines and get served and we sit down and clean up and go on with our day. That's That was kind of skimmed over by Megan a little bit, <laughs> but our staff have done, not only her and her staff in the kitchen, but also our teaching staff who are now sitting in their classrooms while the students have their lunch or breakfast or whatever meal they're having. So I wanna to emphasize to all of our folks um, that this is a huge, huge undertaking every morning and every afternoon to serve meals. So kudos to you, Megan. You, you've done a fantastic, fantastic job. And that's over and above. How many did we pass out today? Uh, 72. 72 delivery or uh, pickups, if you will. They go out the hallway and they pass out meals for seven days, three meals. Okay. So 70 breakfasts and lunch um, for, for the folks that are picking it up, as well as what they're doing. Great job to the cafeteria staff. Thank you, teachers, for allowing the students to eat and social distance in the classrooms. Great job, really. Megan, I have a question. Those families who are fortunate that, that maybe are cautious or concerned about taking anything for free, they say, I, I, I don't need to participate in that. What do you perceive as an effort to encourage them to be able to participate in this special time? What kind of conversations are going on or what kind of information is being sent to those homes? My perception is it's an opportunity during this unique time to assist us with our lunch program that is often years running a deficit. So those families who I'm referring to have helped us in the past with our deficit. Can you answer that question? Did I make my question simple enough? <laughs> I mean, it's, it makes it simple for them, too. You know, it, it's something easy that we have something you can repeat for your kids. It's, to me, it's a no-brainer of the conveniences. Talk to me about the application process. What, you know, what may be perceived as a stigma. If I sign this, it's indicating that I'm getting something for free. I don't want that on the record. What are we doing to overcome that? per se stigma they still have to sign something that says i received this meal is that correct so it, you don't have to technically you do not have to fill out any type of application to receive these meals we are asking that families still fill out the free and reduced meal applications because of title funding i see so yes it, it typically would tie into um if a student were to get free or reduced meals in the school system in person in a typical school year but because of circumstances, it doesn't matter if somebody's be technically a free student, re reduced or a full pay student, everybody's free now. But as far as applications, I mean, nothing is shared as far as there's no information of, well, that student's free, that student's reduced. It's all confidential information that is kept on record just for the sake of, for one, state audits, but two, title funding. I mean, it ties directly in with the district funding to get back for that. So. Again, another, another way you're supporting your school district. Well, let me give you an example and then share with me if I'm listening and hearing you properly. L let's say that we had 100% participation in the application process. Those were screened and let's say we had 
75% who did not qualify for free or reduced lunch. We still could potentially be adding to our numbers because now we have been able to screen, in essence, everyone. And that could improve our numbers. In my, I don't, I don't, you know, that's just an example. I don't care what the numbers, 50-50, I, I don't know. So Am I you, hearing you correctly? Yeah, yes and no, kind of. Um, as far as, I mean, as somebody who, who turns in an application and is technically denied, you don't get more funding from the state for full paid meals. Um, we're looking at free and reduced, but there are opportunities that, uh, that lies in those applications. I can guarantee you there's dozens, if not maybe hundreds of families that really could be qualifying in a typical year as free and reduced. They're just not filling up the paperwork. Okay. So uh, that's what I was getting at, trying to yeah. create the enthusiasm for 100% participation right. if we could right. and, and avoiding any kind of, quote, stigma. So right. and every year the guidelines change as far as the, it's based on household size and your income. So every year the guidelines change. So maybe somebody thinks, oh, there's no way I'll qualify. There, it's very, very likely that you can qualify for reduced or, and again, it's confidential information and why not? I mean, it's, we actually have it on final forms now as well. So it's, if anybody wants to log in, they can fill out right online. They don't even have to send a paper in. If, if there's a stigma also when sending a child paperwork, it's not even there anymore. I mean, you can just do it all online. And it, I mean, talk about accessibility, it's ready at your fingertips. So I would say the other thing, maybe this is what you were getting at it. Sometimes, and it, this all depends on grade bands, number of students, buildings. You could have targeted assistance when it comes to federal funds, building level, uh, title uh, funds, or it could be district-wide. What I think you're saying, Mr. Riddle, is that, that tw going back to that 25% figure, it may not be carte blanche 25% across the district, but could be a specific building. Well, not only do you get title funds for that, but when, when we get a lot of grants, especially in uh, this time that we're all going through. We get requests for grants all the time. Well, you all know there's a lot of stipulations tied to grants, one of which, or a lot of them, are based on need. So if we're able to do what we need to do in order to demonstrate what we actually have as far as the need, that will potentially come back in greater dollars for the district, not only in food service, but in regards to anything from staffing to equipment. So um, I think that's what you were sharing, and it's not just a uh, just a uh, as simple as saying 100% participation in the application process, 25% out, and therefore we get uh, a direct ratio of federal funding to that. Doesn't necessarily work that way, but it does enhance our abilities from what we are actually representing in the Poland School District, our abilities to gain additional dollars through a number of different programs and quite frankly, a number of different grants. So we, we're encouraging folks to at least fill it out like Megan just said, it's all online. There isn't a permanent record. We keep it once the audit's done, it's over, and we move on. So um, thank you for sharing tonight. Uh, I've got a question, Mr. Riddle. So aside from the free and reduced lunch, what's, what's the percentage of participation for COVID stuff? What, take the high school, for example. How many people are, how many students are participating? The high school is always a difficult building. It's extremely minimal right now. Um, I would say on a daily basis, I mean, we have, So but on average, it's probably about maybe 80, 85 kids are getting lunch. So I'm thinking back to high school. you got a classroom of what, 20, 25 kids. They have to eat in the classroom. So you come in with, let's say, five students get free. I would think that people would say, where'd you get that? And they say it's free. I would think when I was in high school, free food. Well, how, I mean, how do I get free food? I would think that that would be yeah. a, a, a sort of... Uh, 
a term a motivator. Of, yeah, motivator for these kids, especially the the athletes. I would think would want to get the free food. I'm assuming it's good food. I mean, I've certainly had your cookies. I don't see them here tonight, but uh, a little disappointed. But uh, <laughs> I would think that, I would think that that would would be a motivating factor. Yeah. Uh, Aside from the stigma, I mean, sure. I, I mean, I, you know. honestly, I've seen that you know it, the motivation there as far as I've actually seen it more for the, at the smaller schools. I mean, as far as union, you walk in, you know, we as far as union, we deliver the breakfast to the classrooms, and thanks to Mr. Thurow, Mr. Masucci, you know, everybody's helping out in this team. You know, it's a team process, but you know, we're delivering those bags of breakfast items, and most days they're hot items to the classroom before the kids even get there to minimize the contact, but a lot of times while well, teachers call down, hey, so-and-so saw the, the pancakes, they look good, can we get one more meal sent up? Or, <laughs> so, I mean, it, there is that, you know, hey, my friend has it, but at the high school, I mean, high schools are always the biggest struggle as far as increasing, but I, I, I agree with you, you know, you would think, yeah. So the meals aren't the same as the in-person versus the remote students, correct? When you're sending out meals for the week, there are Obviously cold, correct? Right. Okay. Some of them are the same entrees per se. Mm -hmm. We're not sending home hot meals, obviously. Wouldn't make sense. Yeah. So we'll send home some frozen entrees with repeating instructions. Um, we send fresh and frozen vegetables, fresh fruits, um, a variety of entrees that some sometimes during the week are entrees offered to in-person students, but just obviously frozen, not freeze up. Okay. Thank you. We have any other questions for Mrs. Romer? I right, thank you very, very, very thank much. You so much. And I wish you luck. I, I, my my thought is is that at the high school, trying to identify some of the student leaders and say, "Hey, can can I educate you? Can I talk with you? Can you help us create some enthusiasm?" Kids are great fundraisers, and they always Absolutely. like to say, "How can I be part of the solution?" So that's my two cents. <laughs> Now we move to agenda item number seven. Uh, we turn this over to our treasurer, Janet Muntean. She's gonna talk to us about our capital project fund uh, and some other things here. Janet. Thank you. So the last couple of months I've shared with you, we have been exploring options of what can we do to basically uh, set up a fund or set aside monies. Um, so when it comes time that we need to replace the turf or uh, the track or resurfacing or, or both, that uh, we're basically being proactive and we're taking those steps now um, so we don't have to worry about it later. So what you have here is, these are a couple draft resolutions um, for you to look over, uh, most of it very self-explanatory on the things that I spoke about last work session. Um, these, this is called a, a capital project fund, which is an 070 fund. Um, we're going to, I'm recommending that we do two separate funds to keep them separate, very clean. Basically, this is setting aside a um, certain amount of money, which you'll see is underlined, for example, in the turf replacement. We're saying that we're going to set aside or move $40,000 annually. And uh, if you recall last work session, I told you that uh, the statute says that the resolutions can be for 10 years. A couple of you had questions on what happens after the 10 years. The answer to that question is, you'll see it at the, uh, basically in section two, at the end of the 10 years in, in uh, instance for the turf replacement is we have a 10 year warranty on the brand new turf. So essentially we're gonna be setting aside money for 10 years and we're never probably going to tap into, quote, this fund. We're not gonna have any expenditures for 10 years due to the warranty. So when the resolution ends 10 years from now, basically the money has to go back to where it originated from. But then the very next resolution is basically taking the money that you set aside and putting it right back into a new resolution. So, and it works the same way with the track uh, re replacement resurfacing fund as well. Um, but in this instance for the track is we know that probably four to six years from now we're probably going to have some expenditures out of that fund. Same thing when the 10 years hit, the balance at that time would go back to the PI, but then the next resolution, it's basically kind of one swoop. It, anything that we've saved will go right back into a new resolution. The only thing different that you will see on the track resurfacing replacement 
um, resolution is the district has uh, $10,600 um, in a track restoration fund rather than monitor and keep two things for the same purpose I've had them incorporated in this resolution so we're basically taking the ten thousand six hundred dollars that is already established putting it into this capital replacement or capital project fund so for the first year we would only be doing fourteen four from the permanent improvement fund because each year after that you can see on that resolution we're suggesting twenty five thousand dollars a year Question Did any, again, is the, yes. turf, the turf warranty is that prorated or is that a hundred percent i'm sorry i can't is hear the turf you warranty prorated or is it a hundred percent coverage for the full 10 years mr janifay can you help answer that question i think it's the product is that what you meant well, I mean, when you say prorated, well, like tires. If you buy tires, they oh, warranty yeah. it after. Is there is there any wear? I mean, if you yeah. if you have a if you have a warranty claim at eight years, are they going to redo the whole thing, or are you going to? Uh, I I don't know. I'd have to look. It's we have it. Uh, matter of fact, I think you we shared it with you. We'll look at the the uh, warranty itself and get back to you. I'm not sure how that because that, that may change the language on the turf thing if you need to tap into it before ten years. Correct. Ago. And I can certainly find that out and see if we need to change that language before we take official action. Okay. Thanks, Jan. Another comment, I guess, is is that should our booster club, mm -hmm. or we've had a great tradition here, we've had the privilege of being the host for yes. a large track invitational. Correct. And if we would raise money and wish to donate to yep. the fund, we would simply continue to encourage that, but that yep. would just kind of go back into the per Correct. improvement fund. That's where those funds have been being receded for the past several years from the invitational, whether it was the all sports boosters or the track boosters. Um, but since we're, we're doing this, anytime there's a donation, I would bring it to the board and it would say to be, you know, receded into the district's permanent improvement fund. So yes, we would still encourage encourage those donations, and that's where those would go. Thank you. Any other questions on the draft resolutions? Okay, I'll get clarification on your question, Dr. Janopoulos. Uh, but other than that, um, these will be um, on the regular scheduled meeting next week for your uh, approval. The second item that I just wanted to share quickly is um, you'll see a quote there from Sweeney's remember as part of our uh, district replacement plan that we've incorporated the last few years part of forging the bulldog future part of the district strategic plan putting that district replacement um, schedule in place um, we had you know was two buses you know vans those types of things spread out uh, throughout the five years However, last year we were supposed to get a van. Remember GM had shut down uh, the van so they weren't in production. Well then when we thought in the spring we would get the van, we were faced with COVID. So needless to say, we did not get a van last year. Uh, the salesman from Sweeney reached out uh, to me a few weeks ago and a van is coming in. And of course he reached out to Mr. Janafe and I right away since he knew that we did not get the van last year and uh, sent over a quote for it at 27.8. Um, he has said that when the van arrives, our mechanics or they will bring it over and make sure it meets all of our needs uh, before we were to go forward. But I wanted just to present it to you to let you know that there is a good chance, <laughs> a potential chance that we might be able to get a van this year. So I just wanted to share that information with you. Good. Any and other just, questions? For yes, you? just a uh, piggyback. We would take our current van that has the least amount of miles. We have two of them. One we also use for uh, uh, grounds, but the one that has the least amount of miles, the one we've been taking the longest distance, we have some body work. Once we get this one in, we'll send that one out. We'll put this new one on that, that uh, delivery every day do the body work and get that one brought up back up to speed just like we've done with our bus fleet so we can now have a brand new van and a van that 
we think we could, you know, last longer with some preventative maintenance on it. Wonderful. Well, that's a great segue to item number eight, a discussion including Mr. Janafe and Mrs. Muntean, if need be, about our facilities. Go ahead, Mr. Janafe. Okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, ask that we pull up the second download first. And that gives you a breakdown of all the things that we've been doing to all of the buildings. And we'll have this up online um, as soon as tomorrow, I think, uh, so that our folks at home can see um, all of the projects that we've been doing since uh, the inception, really, of, of COVID and also the year before when we were putting these down in, uh, on the building of Bulldog's future. You can see what we've done to the, the high school with the sidewalks, the lighting, uh, lighting in this area, as well as the hallways, library, uh, Poland Middle School, McKinley, the sidewalks, sidewalks down the, the uh, from the connector, the repairing of the uh, lot, the parking lot, the new roof on the middle school, the new roof on Dobbins, the sidewalks that we did in front of Union, um, the stadium obviously with the new track and the new turf, and it's designated with work in progress as well as uh, work yet to be done. So I pull that up because all of those items are a part of the Forging the Bulldog's Future. I apologize for the delay. It still might still require me to download it. But if you pull that up, you can see that Janet and I and Mark got together to update. We took out the previous two years that we've completed. We left in 1819, for, in 1920, so we can have a historical perspective, so that you all can have a historical perspective of what the board's vision was moving forward, what was done. Obviously, you can see all the blue that's been laid in there, that's, that indicates the completion. So all of that has been done and continues to be done um, whether we have a pandemic or not. <laughs> and uh, it's important for you, we have right now some of the things that are in blue that are partially done for 2021. We just got the estimate for the driveway, um, the driveway that's, that connects the, the west parking lot with the east parking lot of Seminary High School. That's approximately $31,000. We also just received the um, new softball field, which is slated for 2021. New softball field specs, and that was 200000 But I would also throw in the, uh, the estimate that we put off to the attorneys today that had an additional $50,000 of in-kind work that was donated to the project uh, as we move forward. So, uh, and that is from soup to nuts in regards to the softball field, all the fencing, all the dugouts, all the block work, roof, uh, electricity, the, the uh, scoreboard that was donated, the electric, to install it, donated. Um, the block to, to do the dugouts, all donated. So we're moving forward with that. As far as this facility, you can see the renovation of the auditorium, the um, tennis courts, and the parking lot, where, where, and the restrooms that would be added for the seventh and eighth graders. Those are all being done as we speak, putting together drawings and estimates to to prepare for going out to bid. The um, Dobbins, obviously, the lighting, the carpet, the paint, 
the gym floor. I'm very excited about the opportunity for once the winter sports comes back around with practices and those things for the little for the little ones around the community that they'll go over. I think they'll very be very pleased with the uh, the upgrades to the gym floor for public use. When I say public, meaning our students' use of Dobbins. Um, and, uh, and, and the bus, as you can see, the van, the van that's down there as well. Uh, chrome carts, you know, we've done a lot. We have a lot ordered. We have, I believe, Nadim, we're close to 500 that's on order that we're waiting for. Um, as many of you know, um, some of our technologies that we've been waiting for um, have been on order since March and uh, we're hoping that they come in very, very soon. So uh, we've been kudos to the tech, to the tech department. They've done a fabulous, fabulous job for what we've had, what we've been able to move around. And as you all know, we went to 612 one-to-one -one, and that includes over 300 students having a device at home. Hmm. Whether there's three in one family or in one household, they, they received enough uh, enough Chrome books for all the students in the household. Um, other than that, the finances, I think moving forward, you'll see that um, we'll have to have some conversation moving forward in regards to how we want to explore the com uh, combining of the levies. Um, and, and we've also talked about putting funds away so that we can pay off our debt service earlier as well, which we know that that's, that's got, before we can start, it's gotta be a five year before we can start paying that off early um, due to the term. So we're very excited about where we are, um, what's going on, we're moving forward. I'd be happy to address any questions that we have pertaining to both the Forging the Bulldog Future as well as the the list of all of the uh, items that have been taking place here for the last year to 18 months. I actually do have a question, Mr. Jan. If I, okay. Be, uh, before COVID, we were discussing the drainage. Uh, I believe it's in the middle school. The French drains outside that they were crumbling, and you were having a company go in and look. Well, whatever came back with that? I know COVID hit and I never um, yeah, great question. Asked. So we actually, and I think that was That's down there. Right here. Um, got I think that was part of what wall. we updated, oh, but let me just look real quick. Gotcha. Um, we brought in a company. We actually brought in a company to do what was called, um, what I would call normal waterproofing, right? Mm -hmm. How they drill in from the inside, just do it in the inside. We had three excavators come out and take a look at it. Th all three excavators walked away without giving an estimate of cost because all of those pits, I'm calling them the pits where they, they uh, the concrete work that the basement windows kind of uh, are exposed to. Yep. I'm referring to those as pits. They all said that those would need to be removed, rebuilt and replaced. They all said that, but they didn't come back with a cost. We had another company that we got a hold of, Calo, and they came down right before COVID hit, mm -hmm. and they actually said, wait a second, let's take a look at your French drains underneath those pits. Yeah. So we brought them in, they, they dug two holes all the way down to the bottom of the foundation to look at the French drains and uh, essentially they said, They're, it's a disaster. <laughs> so what, what we used those folks for was to give us an idea that is the traditional waterproofing from the inside, would that work to get rid of all those, those uh, water problems that we have up front? Remember, we've done the roof, we still have to do the spouting, and we would still have to do some sort of fix up front. COVID hit, they end up putting everything back in, 
given us a recommendation that we should go forward with the, the uh, what I would call traditional waterproofing from the inside. Um, so at this point in time, that's where we are with, with the fix for the middle school. Right. Thank you, sir. That's the, that's, and I think it's referenced by the uh, north wall yep. on the uh, charts. Mr. Riddle pointed that out. Thank okay. you, sir. Any other questions I can help? Mr. Danafe, I have a question for you as well in regards to the status of North Elementary. I know that we did have some government entities that were considering leasing the space. Do we have an update around that? Absolutely. So, uh, actually, Mr. Riddle and I talked, and there's a letter in front of you. Did you get that, Mr. Riddle? Yep. May I read this for the benefit of the record? Sure. Uh, Ms. Colucci, we had invited uh, Ed Kempers. Ed is a Poland Township trustee. He is also on the board of what's known as the Western Reserve Fire District. The Western Reserve Fire District is made up of the Poland Village and the Poland Township and a separate entity. And uh, Ed sent this letter and he said, it, Mr. Riddle, thank you for inviting me to tonight's Board of Education work session. Unfortunately, I am unable to be in attendance. However, you can share the following. Years ago, the Western Reserve Joint Fire District was formed. It is separate from Poland Township and the village. It has its own five-member board. I am one of the board members. Several months ago, the Western Reserve Joint Fire District hired an outside company to evaluate our district and to provide guidance on the direction in discussion making in the future. We have not yet received the report. I am only one member and cannot decide anything on my own, but I am guessing that the Western Reserve Joint Fire District will not make any decision about the future use of North Elementary School until the report is received. If you or anyone else with the Board of Education would like to be on the Joint Fire District agenda for our November 11, 2020 meeting, please let me know. In addition, if you have any questions, they can call me and he listed his cell phone number. So, can I, just know, give, can I just give the background on that? Please, I would appreciate so, it. So that letter is in, in what I would consider in response to a visit that a number of their, um, the, the chief, as well as a number of their uh, other trustees, Ed was not there, for our board members um, visited visited with us, asked us about this is what Mrs. Col uh, Colucci's question was on. Um, they inquired because the rules of law allow the board to enter into an agreement with another government agency on any of our buildings without going through an auction sale, you know whatever choice the board wants to make, but if there was an agreement between a government agency that was interested in that property, that could be entered into very similar to what we enter into with the, um, the Poland Little Bulldogs or the PCBA um, for a long-term engagement for that property. So we had vi they had visited us, asked us, called Janet, Janet and I, and, went over and visited with them and they walked walked through the, the building and took a look at various different things. And, and uh, with that being said, they were looking at that building as, as, as information so that they could take to this company that they resourced um, and say, hey, here's a building over here that could potentially be a viable option for their long-term 10-year plan, vision. So I think they used that, provided that information to, I don't know what company that they used, but provided that information to that company and I, they're really just waiting on that report to come back. And I, and I spoke to him today, actually I was out of the office, I called him to get an update and he said, I'm walking into your office to give you a letter to hand to Mr. Riddle. So. Um, very, very, uh, very good timing on that question. So that's what they're waiting on. He, he thought that the report, unless it was different from you, Mr. Riddle, he thought that, that report was going to be coming up pretty quick here, maybe the end of October.
beginning of November. Thank you. You're welcome. And t tell me, what are your thoughts as to the timing? We had, some, it, uh, just me personally, I was hoping that at some time we could get on the agenda, get out to the public, a auction for the contents of that building. And I know, I don't know if the whole benefit of the board knows, but I had questioned you about that a few weeks ago. And you said, Greg, because of COVID, we've taken so much furniture from around the district and stored it there. We should postpone a auction on the contents until the spring potentially. And so I'd just like you to update everyone, sure. you know, for the benefit of the record. Okay. So, what your feelings or thoughts are sure. there? So we know basically what we did is emptied out Dobbins, all the content or most of it, and put it over at the, to uh, North so that we could, as Greg described, go through a an auction of the contents so that we could determine what we need to the building. A lot of the things that we have taken over there are things that either outdated, we don't use anymore, or just contents that have been so large we couldn't throw them in a, away into a, any storage bin, if you will, or a, a trash bin. So, but they may have some some form of value to somebody in an auction. So we moved all that material over there. Well, then again, COVID hit. Well, to create the social distancing, every classroom that had tables now had to go back to the old single desk and single chair. So ended up what ended up happening is all of our custodial staff went back over, took all, took their, some of their materials they were able to store. Some of them, they, like if you go to Union Elementary right now, the entire stage is full of equipment because they had to take it and move it out of the classrooms so that we could create greater space. We went over to grab the, grab the, um, uh, the tables, the chairs from north, bring them over here. And, and, uh, and I asked Mr. Riddle at the time, I said, we're going to have to wait because that stuff we really, hopefully we're going to get over COVID pretty quick. Um, but the stuff that we've retrieved from over there, we really would like to get rid of. We're just using it now because of the social distancing and the space. Once this is over, my guess is we're going to go back to the centers where the students are together and those sorts of things. So I'd hate to have an auction now and then have another auction later when we have other equipment sure. that we would be able to put in there. So uh, that's the update at this point in regards to the content of the uh, of North and the equipment. Okay. Uh, and uh, is there any other, Dr. Donopoulos, do you have a comment about north or I put a for sale sign on it tomorrow that's what you and, and how would you handle it if let's say we sold it to an investor from Cincinnati and that person decided that they were going to lease it to a a, a charter school well I'd have a, a legal verbiage in the contract that they couldn't okay Do, do you have any specifics or awareness of whether that can be done or not? Me? Yes. No, sir. I'm not so you would have to lawyer. defer to our lawyers to see. If yes, sir. Um, I just, just on a side note, I had, because you, when we did our pre-board with Mr. Warren and, and uh, Mr. Riddle, the conversation came up in regards to cost, how long, how, what, what's been our cost since, since the closure. And I will say as surfacy as we can get, all right? So it's not like, like for instance, we just had a pump go out in the boiler. We had to get it. What was the PO on that, Janet? 30? Was it around $4,000? Say $4,000 for the pump for the boiler over at North. So we're doing those things. We're upkeeping it and, and all of the, those sorts of things, as well as the redu reduction of the heat, reduction of the electric, all those sorts of things. We went back since... This is, again, since 15. So this isn't an annual. Please don't take this as our annual cost. Since 15, we're at about um, a half a million dollars upkeep. 
since we've we've vacated the building. Hmm. So that's a half a million dollars uh, that we're spending to heat, snow removal, uh, grass, electric, all those sorts of things. You know we're, we are using it. We have our wrestlers that are over there using the gym. Actually, they're using quite a bit of it. Um, we do have, pe we are still doing preventative maintenance on all the HVAC. We're still going on the roof. We're still repairing roofs. All those little pieces that we're doing, we're, we're still um, putting, putting those dollars into that facility. Is that playground still standing? Yes. To, to address uh, Dr. Dinopoulos, uh, it was my recollection, and I, I could be wrong, but we had a, attorney Britton who represents the district into the district one other time to talk about the disposition of that building. And it's my recollection that he indicated that you cannot legally put a caveat on it. If you put it up for sale, the buyer has the ability to do what they want with it. There can't be a, a quote, a deed restriction. So I concluded from that is, is that we would have to campaign, work very, very, very hard to find a entity from the community who we could work with as a government. So it's my earnest hope and desire that this deal with the fire department could work out or, vi or the village of Poland or somebody that would be interested in utilizing that space and could either somehow partner with the Poland schools or take over the responsibility completely. Otherwise, it's my understanding that we would have to abate the asbestos and tear it down and then seek to sell the land. I'm okay and, with that too. Excuse me? I'm okay with that too. And I, I'm hoping that we could turn that corner and do that sooner than later. That's my personal desire. And, and I, I think so. Well, as a lifelong Poland resident, I would be appalled if the fire district felt they needed that much land and that size of a building. I think they would have a hard time passing a levy again in this community if they were to take over that size of a building and that, that much land for their use. Well, I think that's a great comment. And I think that there comes a time where we as a Board of Education have to draw a line in the sand and say, you know, we've come to a point where we've reached the <laughs> we've reached this testing point. Is there a government entity that's interested? And if they're not, then we have to proceed with that, uh, whatever's legal. But I don't want to see a charter school get into that space and compete with the Poland schools. And Mr. Warren, want, do you have, excuse me, Mr. Janet Faye. Apologize. Mr. Warren, do you have a comment or well, question? It, it seems like we have some interest from the fire department uh, and they're obviously collaborating with somebody who kind of knows what their needs are. Uh, that might be uh, a, a good option, I would think, if you have a public entity that wants it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we can't keep uh, the other side of the coin. If there are no possibilities there, uh, then with the fire district or any other entity, then I think we need to look at what we're going to do rather than dumping a lot of money into it uh, just to keep it in good shape. And, uh, we have to then look at other options. Uh, if, if, we're, if, the, if we don't have a need for it, it, it seems uh, kind of pointless to be spending money on it. Uh, Mr. Polis, do you have like, anything to add to the discussion? I do not, Mr. Rodolfo. Okay. Well, what I'd also like to add is, is that, you know, we, we learned and we worked hard to restore and preserve Dobbins who was built right around the same time. They're very similar buildings. And we learned quickly that a vacant building can deteriorate rather quickly. And if that roof would suddenly begin to pour, we know that it's $400,000 <laughs> to put a roof. And so, you know, I, I think that, that there's a some part of caution uh, also to be you know, prudent about the, the situation also. So that's where I sense a sense of urgency too. They said every single month that goes by and we get through unscathed without a lot of major expense, 
or crime, you know, we're fortunate. We're, we're very fortunate. But sooner or later, we're going to have to have this discussion and we're going to have to, like Mr. Dr. Donopoulos said, you know, try to get that for sale sign up and rule out this possibility of the building and then move ahead with the abating of any asbestos there. And it's going to be a cruel day if we have to meet we have to go to the public and say we have to tear that building down because there's a lot of sentiment. But I do think that it would turn a page in this community and if that could be redeveloped, I think it would be a nice, a nice community over there for some, some families in this community. So uh, that's enough said about that. And uh, Mr. Janifay, are we at the point where you could show us that video sure about would. the roof? Yes, so we've had conversation about this. I wanna remind everyone that the board had talked about when we removed the trees that we were gonna replant them. I, I uh, stopped and talked to... Um, uh, Elliot's. Elliot's, thank you. First of all, I stopped to talk about the snow removal. As you know, they've been our snow removal contractor for Poland Seminary High School and they outsourced the other smaller buildings. Um, I will say that he was interested hesitate a little bit, but interested in continuing that partnership. I will also say that since I've been here, this is my eighth year, he has yet to raise his cost over eight year period of time. So with that being said, he also, they also donate all of the flowers and the, you know, everything that Mrs. Riley does for graduation. Um, I thought it would be a good gesture for me to get a price on him planting, finished planting the pear trees around the stadium. If you noticed coming in off of Dobbins, um, there's one tree all the way at the west end that's real red. It looks like it has died. He was gonna check that out for us. But we used to have arbovitas lining that part of the stadium as well as in front of the tennis courts. And we talked as a board that when we removed those trees, we would replant them. It was uh, suggested that we plant them up the side of the road once we put the road in going up around for the uh, seventh and eighth graders around the seminary high school. Well, we knew that we wanted to replant some of the trees that we took down. So I asked him that as this is planting season now that we could just go ahead and do that so that our community, our residents know that what we said we were gonna do this is what we're doing. We took out the arbovitas because they were all dead. I forget what disease that they had gotten. Um, but we took all of those out and he said, this would be a great time for it. He's gonna give me a price to continue going down both the west side and the east side of the stadium, you know, right out there at the point. So that would form a nice U with the pear trees, get the replanting of the ones that we've taken down. But the, it seems, at least from board members addressing it to me, that we had a uh, concern that, that continual questions arise about why we did what we did. And I think this video will give you a very good explanation. Once this is done, we'll put the video up online um, and the write-up in regards to why we did what we did. But before we do that, I do want to share that we had a number of people that gave us a quote to cut the trees down, but we also had two people come in to give us an idea, can we trim them before we took them down? And the, the both, both, of, both those folks, as well as our group and contractors said, they were so large that you couldn't trim them down to survive without still, they were pinups, they're dropping acorns, they're dropping all those things, and you'll get a visual of what the very start of it was to the end that it is now. And you'll be able to see via drone pictures on this video of truly how much those trees, you know, until you get a perspective of above, very difficult to understand what it looks like from below. So Mr. Zur, could you go ahead and play that? You haven't seen and stop it once we get to the uh, beginning, please. Office, uh, so you can see right there, that's the water that was stagnant on our roof. And remember, there was leaks from the gymnasium all the way down both hallways. You can see the vegetation growing. Folks, we take that, 
Howard confirm with me, with Rick, um, that they would go up there and take all that material down on an annual basis. And that's how much, how fast, you know how fast the weeds grow and it's, it's just a perfect, you know, sunlight with the amount of material on there. And remember, it does, uh, it is misleading here. I want to emphasize that because it is a gravel roof. So this is on gravel. So the end of it is now on rubber and you can see that. So go ahead, Mr. Zura. So it's easier for that growth to happen when it looks like this. So now you're gonna to start to see how much, go ahead, it's good. You're just gonna to start to see how much, how the, much the trees were really over top of, of the building itself. And all those dark spots are where they've taken that gravel off the roof, off the decking, I should say. You can see how, that whole hallway on the west side is almost covered by the canopy of the trees. And I will say as you're going through here that the, the uh, roofing contractor, they said they spent the first hour, hour and a half just getting the material off the roof from the night before so they could start moving forward with uh, the repairs. See all of that to the right underneath the canopy? <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Sir. This is about getting to the final. So all those gables were redone as well. So that entire roofing system has been completed. And this is the washout now this is all from after the trees have been removed. So that's what our current roof looks like. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I know that uh, as the board president, I have been criticized by some by saying, what's the big deal about the trees and why spend so much time? But is the, we also had criticism as a board about not enough communication, not being uh, forthright with the community. So at, at this point, it is what it is. And so I thank you very, 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 very much. And I'm glad it's out there. Is there anything else from this board or for the membership for the good of the order? At, at this time, I need a motion to recommend entering into executive session to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of a public employee or official and conference with the board's attorney to discuss matters which are the subject of pending or eminent court action. May I have a motion to enter into executive session, please? I so move, Mr. Riddle. Thank you, Mr. Paulus, and a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Warren. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion then enters into executive session. I will state that we will not be conducting any additional business after our executive session, and we will note for the minutes when we adjourn. Thank you very, very much.